I want to get into your story. You're growing up, you're a happy kid, but the divorce of your parents when you were nine had a huge impact on you. Um, the divorce of my parents and then also finding out that I was adopted caused me to have these internal beliefs about myself, which I believe were fueled by the, de the devil, the enemy. Mm -hmm. um, and I did not tell anybody about those beliefs. I just internalized them. Yeah. And to try to deal with that as a young child is, is not an easy thing. So by the time, though, you're 13, you go to a youth camp and you make a decision to follow Jesus. I did. You know, I, I tell people about uh, this experience that, you know, the, it, the great message was preached and then an invitation was given, an altar call was given. And I remember distinctly looking down at my knuckles and I was white knuckling the pew in front of me. And for whatever reason, I did not want to go down. I don't know if I, you know, I had friends at church camp or whatever. I don't know, but I, I didn't want to. And and it was almost as if God just took my knuckles and unwrapped them one by one, finger by finger, um, off of that pew. And I was transported down um, to accept Jesus as my Lord and Savior. And thus began the most beautiful um, love story of my entire life. Now, it's interesting because even as we're going to get into some of your things that went kind of wrong in your life and some of the addiction issues in that, but Jesus was always there, which is you know, I think people need to remind themselves, even when they get into these dark places, he still loves us. He still cares about us. But by the time you got to high school, you got into drugs, alcohol, a lot of partying. What was going on? I think those voices uh, that I did not tell anybody about um, and having, quote unquote, daddy issues. I think those things had started to rear their ugly head by that time excuse my French, but I, I had started to call myself words like bastard and illegitimate and unwanted and unloved. And so as much as I was this vibrant, bubbly um, person and vivacious on the outside and doing all sorts of wonderful things out in the world and accomplishing things, I was really living this double life of internalizing these negative beliefs about myself. And, uh, you know, I was doing a number on myself and, and the enemy was, was absolutely behind that. And as I've watched some of your videos from your sideline reporting, yeah, you're this bubbly Rachel. You're just like engaging and you can tell that you had a good chemistry with the players and the coaches and the people that you worked with. But before you got into that part of your life, and I guess during that time, you're also going from relation to relationship. And some of those relationships were pretty abusive. Why did you get into these kind of relationships? Was, was there just something missing in your life? Yeah, I absolutely. I, I say this while I saw dysfunction and I saw abuse growing up, unfortunately, and I've rectified those relationships because forgiveness is such a beautiful thing and so powerful and straight from the Lord and the Bible. Um, at that time, I, I was broken. I teach people this all the time. Oftentimes, we are looking for the world to love us, to affirm us, to lift us up when we, in fact, do not love ourselves. And until we love ourselves powerfully, where nobody else is going to ever fill us up other than Jesus Christ himself, right? The Lord and Savior. But we, we as human beings are running around down here trying to get somebody to tell us we're pretty and look at us and we mm. matter. And truth is, we were born to matter. Truth is, you were born special. Truth is, he knew he knitted you. He knows the number on your hairs, number of hairs on your head, not only the number, but the order of them. And so because I believe I believed those, those internal messages about myself and because I was looking for love in all the wrong places and I did not love myself, I found myself in those destructive relationships. So in relationships, okay, you're looking for that love and you're also, I guess, uh, you know, in the midst of this pretty impressive broadcasting career, I mean, you develop, you know, you decided or discovered that you had this amazing talent, you love sports casting. Was that also one of the things that you were using to try to maybe fill some of the voids that you had in your life, Rachel? You know, I would say this, I, I often tell people I was leading a double life. Mm. And I think this is going to speak to a number of, of the people that are watching your viewers out there, your loyal viewers, or maybe somebody that's just flipping the channels today. I was leading a double life. And, and for me, my secret was addiction. Um, but it, for anybody out there, it can be any kind of addiction. Mine happened to be, to be drugs. Um, but for anybody, it can be porn, it can be money, it can be gambling, it can be food, it can be um, sex, it can be any of these things. And so many of us are carrying this secret sin, this shame of, of being high at work and hi, how are you in your marriage? And hi, how are you in your career and your life? And 
But then in in the secret, in the dark places, we're struggling with addiction or struggling maybe with a double life. So I really just want to speak to anybody who's carrying a secret sin, a secret weight, and and tell you come out of that. Jesus is is the answer, man. He he. I get so jacked about it. People ask me all the time, "Why do you love Jesus so much?" And I said, "If you've been where I've been, should have been dead twenty times over in a ditch." But the Lord and Savior never stopped calling to me, never stopped loving me, never stopped beckoning to me and telling me I created you for more than this, my daughter. Wow, I love that, Rachel. And 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 I guess you know, as a broadcaster, and you know, I've been you know doing that a long time. You can kind of fake it. You get kind of good at faking and be having a bad yeah. day. And and even in our whole lives, we can sort of project this thing. But in your life, by so by 2009, uh, you're selling drugs. You're you know you're addicted to cocaine. I mean, this was a real low point at your life. And now going back to this time when you're 13, made this decision to follow Jesus. He starts speaking to you. What was he saying to you? He was saying to me, it was just a, 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 about a year or so before 2009. 2009 is kind of the mark. I got my, my life back on track uh, and actually ended up covering a national championship that year and moving to a new place. But previous to that, he had been whispering to me and saying, I created you for more than this, Rachel. Um, you're going to end up, I remember distinctly, he gave me the vision of a runaway train going the wrong way down a track. And he said, this is you right now. And you're going to end up, you know, killing somebody else, killing yourself, end up in jail, breaking your family's heart or all of the above. I created you for more than this. And here's what I think is so important for people to know. Never in this was there condemnation. It was conviction. It was, it was never you're dirty, you're stupid, you're broken. You know, this idea that so many people have of, of God, it was no, my girl, my daughter, my beloved. Yeah. I, I remember again, around that time, seeing a vision of the Lord in the corner of my room one morning when I woke up from a partying night and the look on his face was, was not mad. It was, I love you. And I am hurt genuinely that you're living like this and come home to me, my girl, come home. And so I was tired. I was tired of drugging and lying and manipulating. I was tired of feeling broken. And it was around that time that God supernaturally took that desire away from me for hard drugs, for cocaine. And and um, and I rededicated my life, and I've never looked back since. No, I, what, I, what a beautiful story. You know, it's uh, it's not the condemnation. It's his compassion that draws us back. So let's skip ahead to 2019. I, you know, you've recommitted your life to Jesus, and things are going well. But you decided to leave your sports broadcasting career, which was, you know, doing phenomenal. As I mentioned, a trailblazer. Why did you leave? I left because I found what sets my soul on fire. And I just feel like there's so many pivotal points in, in our conversation today that are going to touch people. Mm -hmm. But I think there are people out there that are listening that um, they're just existing. They're wishing for Fridays and dreading Mondays and wondering what is this life for? And it, it feels empty. And I had always been for 17 years a sportscaster and I had allowed, I didn't even know it, this ident my identity to be wrapped up in sportscasting. I was Rachel the sportscaster and I loved it. I loved it. I loved it. I loved it. But then over the six years previous to 2019 or five years previous, I should say, I had created something called I'm Changing the Narrative, which is a movement. And uh, I was speaking and traveling and talking about good love for yourself and good love for others and mental health and interpersonal relationships and purpose outside of your job or athletics. And it had gotten so big that um, the Lord that whole year had been knocking on the door of my heart saying, I want you to quit sports casting. I was tired. I was doing, you know, sports casting and traveling and speaking and creating a national movement. And I was, uh, there was, there was never enough time. I woke up tired, went to bed tired, and God had been working on me for a full year to retire, take a leap of faith, and he was going to teach me to fly or he was going to catch me, and he did just that. Um, he did it just before the pandemic to really encourage my faith. <laughs> Yeah, but uh, but yeah, I retired after hosting the first ever mental health game, national collegiate mental health game between um, the University of Minnesota and Maryland. And both teams were fully engaged and on board talking about mental health. 
And we changed a lot of lives that day and that week. I love that analogy. They're going to teach you to fly or he's going to catch you. I, I gotta, I, I'm going to have to use that. I just think that's absolutely so powerful. So when you're not speaking and you're no longer a sportscaster, you have a book coming up in June of 2023. It's called Relentless Joy. Find, keep, and cultivate joy in a crappy world. Tell me about the book, Rachel. <laughs> I love the title. Yeah, I love it, right? Um, it is you know, what's funny is I read, I, um, I read my retirement letter that was October 26, 2019. So just three years ago, a few days ago, and in it, it says, I'm going to slow down and finally write the book. I've been promising myself I was going to write. And by golly, I wrote that book. I wrote that book. And so it's coming out next year. It is all about how to, as I'm, as you mentioned, how to notice joy, how to be a joy starter, how to put joy out in the world, how to cultivate joy, how no matter what, even from the fetal position to raise your hands and pray and praise and say, I may not be where I want to be, but I'm on my way, baby. And if I've still got breath in my lungs, I still have purpose and I've got a purpose on this planet. And I, I feel like if we could be more joy starters, joy spreaders, more noticers, people that uh, instill joy and spread joy, this would be a better world. And this book is all about that. And the coolest thing is, it's kind of my story. But then at the end of each chapter, there's a section where you can apply the, the lesson to your life. So I say it's part journal, part memoir, part um, workbook, if you will. It really is a journey in joy. Well, when it is released, we'd love to have you back on 100 Huntley Street. Just absolutely love your passion, Rachel. Uh, you're an inspiring lady and uh, you bring joy. And, uh, and I thank you for all that you're doing from one fellow, our former sportscaster to another. Thank you for being on 100 Huntley Street. And by the way, if you'd like to learn more about Rachel and some of the amazing things that she's doing uh, to get free, to get healed. You can go to rachelbarbeau.com. That's rachelbarbeau.com. We have it on the screen. Thank you so much for joining us today, Rachel. Absolutely, and thank you. And I just will say this in parting, I love to hear from people. So if this touched you, send me an email and let me know. It's my lifeblood. Other than Jesus, hearing from people that I made a, a difference in your life is everything to me. And thank you so much for having me on. Well, thank you for being with us.